Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You guys better be familiar with this show by now. It's where I get to sit down with the world's top creators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. If it's your first time with us, welcome. If you're a returner, you're gonna love this episode. My guest today is an author that I've been following for a long time. I first saw his work when he wrote a book called The Accidental Creative. His next one was called Die Empty. You can see where this is going. And today we're here with his new book, Mr. Todd Henry and Herding Tigers. Welcome to the show, bud. Thanks, Chase. Great to be here. Super happy. So we were we were internet friends. We were right? way back, way back when. Do you want to say like on it, IRC or something? Yeah. It's like yeah, like in, like two thousand three <laughs> or four or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, I remember you had a podcast called The Accidental Creative. Yeah. Like it, it was literally the first creative podcast that I ever saw, which made me say, "Crap." I got to do a podcast, and this was in the early 2000s, right? Yeah, it was, so, it was like 2005 is when yep. we launched a podcast. Okay. It's funny because at the time I thought, oh, I'm so late to the podcast thing. You know, which it, I mean, it's funny. It's you know, 2018 and it's I, I think I missed the now. curve, you know. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, but there weren't a lot of podcasts about creativity no. at the time. So. None, right? Yeah, so yours right. inspired me to do one, and it was a video one. And you, I don't know if you knew this from the video side. I think the audio ones were always free, but video you had to pay for your bandwidth. Right, yeah. Well, I my audience was growing quickly, and I had a really popular one, and I got a $9,800 <laughs> bill for a podcast in 2006, actually. And done. Yeah, I'm like, wow, <laughs> I need to bring some sponsors on. Woo. Um, right. Anyway, super good to meet you in person. This is literally our first time meeting it in is. person, right? It is, We've been shipped in the night at a couple of conferences with Chris Gillibo. We have a lot of mutual friends. Yeah. I'm super happy to have you here. Thanks, oh, man. Thanks, man. Um, and I love your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's, we're all just, you know, digging our ditch. And we were talking right before we came on camera about, um, you know, your your arc as an author. Uh, I gravitated to your work specifically because you were targeting creatives. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easy for us to say here in, in 2018, the rise of the creator is so obvious. It's been coming for, you know, decades, if not years, the internet has changed everything because now we've got tools and access to information and everything is democratized. But you were on this sort of creator tip, basically as, as early as I remember being sort of targeted outside of art schools and, you know, all those more traditional things that happened, you know, 20 years ago, the new way of thinking about creativity and your own empowerment. Right. What got you into it? Well, it was really out of necessity. Um, I was a create on demand professional, right? Yeah. I was having to go to work, having to solve problems, um, leading a small team of, of designers and writers and, yep. and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, it was really just sort of a survival <laughs> mechanism for me to try to figure out how can I stay healthy? Yeah. Um, how can I keep my team healthy? What is it that some of the people who seem to be producing great work over time, what is it they seem to have in common that makes them yeah. different from everyone else? Yeah. And so started doing a tremendous amount of research. This is like in the early 2000s. We're, um, just, we're just referencing the early 2000s. I, over and over. I like, pulled out the encyclopedia, <laughs> opened it up. Like, the card hmm, catalog creative, in the library. Creative. Um, and, uh, you know, and then and found some patterns, yeah. you know, among some of the people who seem to be really prolific, brilliant, and healthy, as, yeah. I, as I sort of tagged it. And started um, kind of sharing those things with my team, and then you know this whole new thing called podcasting became a thing. Right. Um, and so I thought, well, hey, maybe there are people out there who might want to have these same conversations. And so I started teaching some of the the things I was learning with people out there in podcast yeah. land, and the podcast quickly took off. It's a funny story because I called it the accidental creative. Yeah, and um, I you. Know, Maybe like you, I know I kind of put a bunch of episodes out and kind of forgot about it. Like there wasn't any yeah. strategy. I was just trying to yeah. like put some something valuable out there into the world. Yep. And uh, I kind of forgot about it. I went back to iTunes like a month later, and there was a podcast called The Accidental Creative that was one of the top podcasts on iTunes. And I thought, oh no, I stole somebody's name. Like I thought I had literally stole it, and it was my podcast. I didn't realize <laughs> there were actually like lots of people listening to it. Um, and so from there, it kind of grew <clears throat> and became. You know, gave me more opportunities, obviously, to connect with create on-demand professionals out in the marketplace, and you know, now there's a consultancy and a bunch of books and all of that, but it all sort of began with this, like trying to scratch my own itch yeah. kind of thing, like trying yeah. to solve my own problem, which is how can I stay 
healthy as a person who has to go to work every day, who has to solve problems, who has to do it on demand in order yeah. to keep my job. You know, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, I think that's fascinating, and I want to go right to something you, you said on demand creator like yeah. three or four times. Never heard that before, besides mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. So what, like, what do you mean by that? Isn't it or, or, like? Isn't that part of your job as a creator? Or what's the on-demand part? So how, how are you looking at that? Well, I mean, you know, wouldn't it be great if we just got to go to work every day and be like, hey, whenever you get this done, it's fine, right? <laughs> put a beret on That's and right. put your feet up. Yeah, just be sort of the precious joint. creative yeah. that has all the time and resources and space in the world. But that's not what we get, you know? If you're designing, if you're writing, I mean, you have uh, a strategy that you're trying to work within, you have a deadline you have to hit, you have a budget typically yeah. that you're trying to, to work within. Yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, the brilliant idea has to be there on Wednesday afternoon because we have a client pitch on Friday, right? right? Um, and that, you know, that's, that is the very definition of creating on demand. I mean, yeah. you're basically trying to organize something that doesn't want to be organized. The creative process doesn't want to be organized, yeah. right? There's no predictability there. It's not like, oh, well, if I just do A, B, yeah. and C, then I'm gonna get a great result on the yeah. other side you don't know when that brilliant idea is gonna happen. And so yeah. the only thing that I could figure out that people who seem to be consistently brilliant, not, I mean, not accounting for talent, because obviously some people are just unbelievably talented, but even talented people, yeah. if they don't have some kind of infrastructure in their life, will yeah. eventually wither, they'll eventually burn out. It's and so, so true, the thought of like, I think people at home who are just getting into or dis discovering their own creativity, and they look at what they think a professional does out there, they think it's, oh my gosh, it is just like you sit around with the beret, sip coffee at the coffee shop until right. a great idea hits. But the reality is that the constraints are actually the things that drive creativity. That's right. And sometimes those constraints can be very, make you very uncomfortable. Which, they can, yeah, yeah. And but, but they're necessary. Yeah. I mean, um, Orson Welles said, the absence of limitations is the enemy of art. Right? And I think that's very true. I think that we have to have some kind of boundary within yeah. which to create, within which to channel our focus and our yeah. energy. And if we don't have that, then it's really difficult to make any kind of progress. Yeah. And so disciplines and rituals and uh, you know, having somebody to set those boundaries for you yeah. as a creative can be really helpful, especially if you're not good at setting those boundaries for yourself. It can be helpful to have somebody else who helps you channel that creative energy effectively. Yeah, okay, so those are basically tactics for being successful. So you talked about like being an on-demand creator. You also touched on something that I love, which is not broadly talked about, which is self-care. Right. And there is a concept of the creative genius who you know goes mad in their 20s, and by 28 they find a way to either kill themselves or be killed, or are you know it's it's like this concept of the tortured artist is something I'm actively trying to program against because I think it's fiction. I think you know there's the best stuff happens over an arc of a creative career. And if, you know, there's so many folks out there who are trying to go from zero to one and they're, you know, 47 years old and they're like, you know, I'm gonna leave my job in the cubicle farm and go discover myself. And so, it's such a true statement that that is often when the best work can be done. But we don't talk about that in our culture. So talk to me a little bit about, um, you talk about wellness and longevity and self-care. What's your concepts there? Yeah, I, I think really success as a create on-demand professional needs yeah. to be categorized as, am I prolific? Meaning, am I doing a lot of work? Because we have to do that, right? Yep. Is, is my work brilliant? So am I actually doing good work? But um, the third piece I think that has to be taken into consideration is, am I doing it in a healthy way? Am I doing it in a sustainable way? Um, because, you know, and, and I'm sure you know a lot of people as I do, people who, are, they think creativity is like you know, water from a spigot. You just turn it on and hey, this is really easy. And they're just running, 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 chasing after whatever it is they're chasing career-wise. And then they hit a wall. Eventually they realize I'm not a machine. Yeah. Um, we're not machines. You know, we're human beings. We're wired for rhythm. Uh, and so if we don't have some kind of infrastructure, then yeah, we may, we may produce a lot of good work for a short amount of time, but eventually everyone will hit the wall. Yeah. Um, either your work will suffer, either you'll start cranking out work that's not quite as creatively intuitive as it once was. Um, either you know, perhaps maybe you'll slow down your pace of production because you're not wired to be able to continue cranking that out or you will destroy your mental or physical health in the process um, because you're treating yourself like a machine. You know, any, any good machine needs good inputs, needs care, right? right. Like if you don't uh -huh. put oil in your car's engine, eventually right. you're gonna find yourself broken down by the side of the road. Yeah. And we, we have to take care of 
the machine of our creativity. You know, we have to take yeah. care of ourselves. And that begins by building rituals, building disciplines um, yeah. around, you know, how we inspire ourselves, um, how we protect our, our margin, our space, yeah. our energy. Um, that's something we don't think about with, with regard to creativity is, you know, it requires energy. You know, I've heard this called emotional labor, right? Like we, we, have to, <laughs> we have to protect our ability to bring emotional labor to our work or it's gonna yeah. feel hollow. It's yeah. not gonna be the kind of work we're capable of producing. So, you know, get great <laughs> creatives and great leaders have great rituals. All right, so softball, next question. <laughs> is you've talked to so many people, and again, this is part of what I'm trying to do on the show. I've had, um, you know, folks who are sort of wildly sort of uh, pixie dust creators on the show and there are fewer and further between sure. than the folks who have morning rituals, have creative rituals, have um, just a plan and a program. And the thought of that, I used to like actively resist schedules and this is the man trying to keep me down. And what I felt, what I found was when I switched and started developing some rituals, like when, when was I the most creative? What did it look like? If you can deconstruct what was going on in my life, what were the couple days before, a couple days after, right. and start building some systems around that. So you've talked to so many people in researching your books and writing, patterns, habits, what's the common, what are some common threads around yeah. A, creating creativity for yourself on demand, and then we'll shift gears after that into, and talk about uh, um, longevity and health, but let's start sure. off with this. Yeah, so there are really kind of five core areas that I've mm -hmm. discovered that, um, and, and unwittingly, maybe yep. they have these disciplines or these rituals in their life, but um, five kind of core areas where most creatives who are prolific, brilliant, and healthy seem to have some degree of ritual. The first one's in the area of focus, okay. meaning they're really good at defining what they're doing and they're really good at winnowing down their priorities to just the critical few. Yep. So um, most prolific, brilliant, and healthy creative pros that I know don't have 50 projects that they're working on at the same time. Yeah. They have a critical few, and they have yeah. some on the back burner yeah. for sure, but they have a critical few that they're channeling their creative energy into. So they're really good at setting rails and establishing uh -huh. focus and yeah. understanding the problems that they're actually trying to solve yeah. with their work. Um, and you know that, that begins by just simply sitting down and defining those priorities. Yeah. Okay, what am I going to do this week and what am I not gonna do this week? What am I not gonna focus on? Because, uh, you know, I don't know, like probably yeah. like me, I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, I tend to, you know, bounce from shiny object to shiny object <laughs> if I don't have those kinds of rails. Right, yeah. exactly, you know. So focus is important, relationships. Yeah. Um, we, we do most of our creative work on our own, yeah. right? Um, creative work is done in isolation. If we're part of a team, a lot of the intuitive creative work has to be done on our own. Most highly productive creatives have some relationships in their life where they're seeking inspiration. Yep. People who are calling out the best in them, saying, hey, you're really good at this. Hey, have you ever thought about this? Hey, you should try this, right? Yeah. Um, but a lot of creatives tend to isolate themselves. They tend to withdraw from you know, the social construct, yeah. um, especially when they're working on really difficult problems. So we need to be intentional about building relationships that inspire us, that challenge us, that keep us on course. Um, and not just the people we work with, uh -huh. not just relationships of, of convenience, but yeah. uh, we need to seek out people in our life who will push us and challenge us. Um, energy management. Yeah, this is another Love big this one. one. Love yeah, this um, one. Uh, creative, pros who are prolific, brilliant. I mean, again, there's this myth of like, oh, I'm gonna stay up until two in the morning and I'm gonna get up at six and I'm gonna like, you know, pound two or three Red Bulls and just kind of tackle the day. Well, that's not gonna, that, that's gonna work for you for a while. Yeah, and then terrible. you are going to hit the wall, yep. right? You have to, you have to treat your body with care. If you want to, I mean, your, your mind and your body and all of it, it's an ecosystem uh -huh. that you have to care for um, if you want to get your best ideas. And so uh, one of the ways to do that very simply is to practice pruning. Pruning. Yeah, pruning. Um, so in a vineyard, one of the primary roles of the vine keeper is to prune new areas of growth off the vine, right? Like perfectly good fruit. Why would yeah. you prune perfectly good fruit off of a growing vine? Well, it's because if you don't, then eventually that new fruit will steal resources from the older, more mature, fruit-bearing parts of the vine, right? There's not enough, there aren't enough resources to go around to bear that much good fruit if yeah. you're not regularly pruning. Um, well, we don't struggle with new ideas, new projects, new initiatives, new things we want to take on, new you know, social commitments that we want to put into our life, right? And sort of cram it all in. We think, well, as long as I have the time, I can do it. Yeah. The reality is every commitment we make requires something of us. 
Um, even if it's not a part of our work or a job, it still requires something of our energy. And so yeah. we have to be really good at pruning and saying no um, to really good things, by the way. Sometimes really good things need to go away so that something better can be born. We have to protect the white space yeah. in our life because it's in the white space that creativity and innovation and new connections are formed and all of that happens, right, is in the white space. So, wow. so energy is really important, stimuli. Yeah. We have to monitor the stimuli that come into our brain. Um, we have to be filling our mind with inspiring ideas, inspiring thoughts, yeah. um, even opposing viewpoints. We need to be putting ourselves in circumstances that challenge us, that make us uncomfortable. Um, so if you're an introvert, go to a dance club, right? If you're an extrovert, go to a museum and don't talk to anyone all day. It's like incredible, but, but it forces you to interact with the world in new ways. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Sample, uh, former president of USC, said we should be making it a discipline to commune with great minds. And I think this is what's so brilliant uh, about this concept of stimuli is that when yeah. we are filling our minds with the ideas and the inspiration of other people, we're yeah. basically getting to live through their lives, right? Yeah. We're getting to draw from them as inputs to our creative process. And then finally, um, hours. Okay. Prolific, brilliant, and healthy creatives tend to have some rituals or disciplines around how they use their time, but not just for efficiency, but for effectiveness. Yep. Um, one very simple practice that I, I try to teach Create on demand pros is something I call backburner creating or secret work. Um, <laughs> one of the I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> da, da, da. That's right. Um, one of the um, unfortunate side effects of creating for a living is that you get into what you do because you love what you do. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the flame that really animates you. You're like, oh, this is this is amazing. I get I get to do what I love I and paid. I get paid for it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And then. A short time down the road, you suddenly realize I'm actually doing this more for the paycheck than I am for the thing that I love to do, and you lose your first love. Mm -hmm. And so I always ask Create On Demand pros, do you have anything in your life that you're creating right now that nobody's paying you for, uh, nobody's looking over your shoulder and judging, yeah. so you're not trying to hit a strategy, you know, you, do you have any unnecessary creating in your life, or is the totality of your creating going toward your work life, toward yeah. your create on demand work. Um, it's really important for our creative spirit, for our creative soul, that we have some kind of secret work that's not yeah. for public consumption, yep. but it's just unnecessary creating something we're doing to fill ourselves, to feed ourselves, uh, as a way of keeping that, that flame alive. Do you find that there's a pattern in creators that the thing that is their secret work in your world or the side hustle or any of these other great sort of popular terms in pop culture here, that they end up being your next thing? Or oh, very is this, often, yeah. Is this like a, is it a, yeah. more of a maintenance or does that end up becoming their next thing even when it was thought that they couldn't make money? Like what, what, yeah, what's, very, what's the relationship? Very there? often because you're not, people aren't thinking about is this practical? Right. They're just thinking, where, you know, where, do, where does my intuition, intuition want to take me? Yeah. Um, and so yeah, very often it becomes the next thing or it becomes a new business, a new opportunity, which then creates an interesting paradox because then it's the thing you're doing for money, right? right. So then you right. have to figure out, okay, well, what's the other thing I'm gonna do? Yeah, but that's um, like this, it's almost it. like an incubator. That's right? how you grow. Yeah. That's how you grow. You, you know, the reality is a lot of us don't have the space and the freedom that we need to take the kinds of risks we really wanna take with our on-demand work because yep. we're doing them for a client or we're doing them for a, a boss who has very specific, specific expectations. Yep. And so we have to go outside of our work to be able to take those risks and try new things. Well, sometimes when we do that, we realize, oh, this is really good. Yeah. You know, there's something here. Either I can apply this to my on-demand work uh -huh. now that I know it works, or maybe this is something new I need to explore. But we would never know that if we don't have the discipline in our life of engaging in unnecessary creating. Unnecessary creating, that's yeah. like such a great term. I, I just confessionally hear like all of the best things in my life have come from that sort of side thing. Like, I was, you know, going to graduate school, focused on, um, you know, at first it was medical school, and then it was a, a PhD in philosophy, I and I, had, yeah, wow. and I had these. Huh. My photography was always running in the background. I was huh. like, I gotta really want to find a way to make that work. I was running super small scale fine art, selling just a couple of prints to people that I knew that cared, and uh, and then obviously, if I could transform anything in my life, I'd be able to do this. It made the leap, and then. With photography, it was, you know, oh, then, man, I got this, this idea for an iPhone app. It was called Best Camera, and boy, we, you know, we built that on sort of incubator on the side. Yeah. And it was like, that can never add up into anything because, gosh, it's, you know, at that point, it was a two megapixel camera. I can see where it's going, but 
It's just right. informing the rest of my my work and it'd be inspirational. And then that, you know, millions of people got on that app. And then Creative Live was actually the same thing. It was like, cool, oh, we'll have a side thing where we help creators and entrepreneurs learn skills and the, from other people. You know, and here they are. Each one of those things has become sort of my personal next big thing. I think it's fat. Like, I never really think of that as a, a paradigm, yeah. but clearly it's... Well, it is, but, but I think one of the challenges that we have to confront is, you know, we want to make it a thing too early, yeah. right? So, like, if you had set out with Creative Live and you're like, I'm going to grow this into a, you know, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of people watching our classes and we're going to, you know, like, yeah. that, that, those, those rails from the beginning would have probably constrained how you thought about that project. Yeah. But because you were basically giving yourself permission to play, yeah. to experiment, to try something, to build yeah. something on the side, to kind of tinker with it, it didn't yeah. have to be good yeah. initially. Um, didn't have to be for public consumption initially, right. um, but just because you gave yourself permission to do that, it actually turned into something really beautiful that it may oh. never have been had yeah. you not given yourself that permission. Play, the word play, I love it. We've had Charlie Hone on the show before, yeah. his book yeah. Play It Away, that was more dealing with anxiety. I think the way that you're framing it is as a constructive, positive thing that builds on whatever it is your, your core focus is. So, right, right. Um, you, your, your first couple of books, you know, Die Empty and Accidental Creative, were focused clearly very specifically on the creator and the mindset and habits and rituals. I don't want to go too far from that. I think it's really important. But what I love about the book, your newest one, Herding Tigers, when, is, when does this drop? Is uh, it just, it's out. It just it's dropped. Out. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, so Herding Tigers is for people that work with creators as right. well, right? It's, there's a lot of... Um, constraints and whether you're leading yourself or you're in an organization where you have to sort of foster and grow, whether you're, you know, a lot of people who start off as indie designers end up managing, they, they start their own design studio and right. then they have to be designer plus sort of leader or in an organization. I, it used to be a nice to have. Now the most, you know, successful companies in the world are wildly creative, you know, Apple yeah. Computer, Virgin, you know, you can see where there's a culture of creativity and design embedded in the, in the company. How do you facilitate creativity in those environments? That's a huge, you know, herding tigers, not herding cats. Of right, course, there's right. a beautiful play there. But why the book and what do we need to know about it? Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of leaders, as you mentioned, a lot of leaders of teams came up through the ranks as a designer, a writer, a photographer, yep. right, or, or doing some sort of... Um, tactical work within the organization, tactical creative work. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they're so good at that that they get promoted into a managerial role. Great, you're, you're a great designer. You know what you should do? You should manage other designers. <laughs> well, that's an entirely different skill set. Totally. Um, and not only that, but like their entire career up to that point has been a giant setup, right? Basically, your entire career as a, as a creative is if you control the work and make the work great, right? So if you're really good at doing the work, you're a great designer, you control it, it's all about you, it's about making the work great, then you're gonna get more money, you're gonna get better clients, you're gonna get promoted, all of that stuff. Yep. The moment you become a manager, that paradigm goes completely out the window, right? Because yep. your job is no longer about controlling the work, your job is about leading the work. So you get to a point in your life and your career where you get promoted into a manager, so everything that you've right. known about your life and your career and how I get ahead is now completely false. Because like if you the Matrix, right? You took it the is. wrong pill. <laughs> it is, it's exactly what it is. Because the moment you cross that line, if you try to control the work of your team, if you step in and do the work for them, if yep. you step in and tell them how to make decisions, if you do you know, all, and, and you're basically doing the work for your team, mm -hmm. then you're not allowing them the space and the freedom they need to be able to grow, to be able to tackle new and more challenging work and to develop in their career and to develop their own intuition, their yeah. own creative intuition. Yeah. So your team's capacity will never scale beyond the scope of your direct involvement. So it requires a totally different set of skills than doing the work. Yeah. You have to move from control to influence. And this is, this is really difficult, especially for control freaks right. like me, right? Yeah. When you suddenly, are no longer tasked with doing the work, but leading the work. Yep. That means you have to set rails, you have to protect your team, you have to create space for them. You have to sometimes let the work fail yep. in the short term so it can succeed in the long term so that yeah. your team can develop and grow and understand how to make decisions. This is really difficult because guess what? When that work isn't as great as it could be, it reflects on you. Well, how have you been defining yourself your entire career as a creative? I do great, great work. work yeah. yeah, I am known for the work I do. Well, how do I define They're, myself now as a leader? Yeah. I, well, I, 
I lead other people in doing the work, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a totally different way of thinking about your life and your career. So really, I wrote this book for people who have never really had a roadmap yeah. about how to lead the creative process. So we talked about rituals before. Well, yeah. how do you create an environment in which creative people have the space and the focus and the relational connection and the amount of energy they need, right? Yeah. How, how do you keep them inspired? Like, how do you do that as a leader? Um, and it's a, it's a really tall order, yeah. you know, because it's a completely new set of skills. Yeah. What do you think about, let's, let's go into some of these specifics for a second, because, you know, all your, the research you did, you've, you clearly found out what some habits uh, for individuals, and we'll compare maybe individuals, and then we'll do uh, sort of as a leader, what are some habits that fostering, you know, teamwork or camaraderie, or what are some paradigms yeah. that you saw? So go back to the individual. I know we're jumping around a little bit, sure. just to yeah. make it dynamic for the listener or the Perfect. viewer. Perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, habits and patterns that you saw for individual creators. Go. Yeah. You talked about some nine to five, some hours. All you know, we kind of right. ran through that. Is right. there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, well, really, uh, you know, part, part of the other thing about herding tigers, um, I'm not taking it back to that. No, no, it's good. No, 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 it's good. <laughs> but part of it was I realized that a lot of creatives in organizations um, don't understand how to communicate what they need yeah. to their manager. Right? They don't have terminology for it. They don't know how to say what's wrong. And you know, there are all these myths that exist about creative people. Right? Um, oh, they're so sensitive. Oh, they're so full of ego. Oh, they're you know, it's all about the idea. Oh, they just want to like complete freedom. You, I mean, you and I know, we've been doing this for a long time, yep. we know that most of those myths are not true, true. about the Absolutely. vast majority of, now there's some, there are some egomaniacs <laughs> out there, there's some really unhealthy people, right? Sure. Of course. But not the vast but majority of But they're that in everything in the world. Absolutely. Like they're right. egomaniac salespeople, right? Yep. Or, you know, whatever. So it's, those, those myths are largely untrue. But the reason that behavior is exhibited is because of, it's, it's a response to poor leadership. It's a response to creatives not getting what they need. Yep. And, so when we talked about things like focus and relationships and energy stimuli hours, yep. those really fall into two kind of categories for creatives in terms of what they need from the organization. Mm -hmm. The first thing is they need stability. They need to know that there is a stable playground on which they can do their work, right? Yeah. There are clear boundaries. Um, they need clarity from their leadership. So tell me what we're gonna do, when we're gonna do it, what we're not doing, how we're gonna do it. I want a clearly defined process yeah. so that I can take creative risks. It's difficult to have an Ill, illy, a poorly defined process. And also, by the way, also we want you to go out and take all of these creative risks within right. the midst of this poorly defined process. Well, no, yeah. I need some stability yeah. so that Maybe I can- feel safe so that I can run all the way up to the edge and not over it. And, That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. And, and I know where my hand's gonna get slapped, right? Like, yeah. hey, here are the boundaries. Do anything you want inside of here, but if you cross this boundary, that's when you're going to get in trouble. Like we need that. Yeah. Um, we also need protection from our leadership. We need to know that you're going to protect the time and the space that I need to do what Cal Newport calls deep work. Yep. To do the deep creative work that I, I need to be able to do. So I need to know you're going to go to bat for me. Yeah. If I fail, I, I need to know that you're going to actually stand up for me. You're not going to throw me under the bus. Yeah. So I need those things from my leadership. So stability is huge, but I also need to be challenged as a creative. I need to not be bored. I need to be pushed to yeah. take risks. I need to know you believe in me, that you see me, that you know me, you know what I'm good at, you yeah. know what I'm not good at, um, that you're coaching me, helping me be better at what I, you know, what I do. That if I do make a creative leap, that you're gonna be there to catch me if I fall, yeah. right? Um, and I want to feel like I'm doing work that matters, that there's, there's a why behind what I'm doing. Yeah. This is one of the complaints I hear from creatives and organizations all the time. It's like, yeah. we're doing a lot of work, but I have no idea why any of it matters. Well, for highly talented people, we need to see not just what you expect from me, but yeah. why does this matter? Yeah, where's the, my impact? Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the intuition that we bring as creatives, is yeah. the ability to take a core why and say, well, I know you're asking for this what, but what if we did this instead? It's tied back to this core why, right? Like yeah. We have the ability to make those intuitive leaps, but we have to understand the why behind it first. The problem, Chase, is that stability and challenge Exist in tension. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Th they do, right? Yep. So it's as like you product and marketing, it's there's a hundred year old problems, or in this case, you know, thousands of year old problems. Absolutely. So as you challenge your team as a leader, you're going to destabilize the organization by by nature because you're pushing them, you're wanting them to take new risks, try new things. That's going to create instability within the process. And as you stabilize, you tend to decrease the amount of challenge they feel. Yeah. So as a leader, we have to kind of keep our finger on the dial, not just for 
our organization as a whole, but yeah. for individuals, like I need to know what Chase needs. Yeah. I need to know what Jill needs. I need to know what NASA needs, right? I need yeah. to know what Norton needs, right? Yeah. I need to know what all of these people need from me as a leader. And some people might need more challenge. Some people yeah. might need more stability, but I need to be able to dial those things in for my team in order to get the best work. It's so smart. And if you think of, you know, we're talking about maybe individual creative process here, a designer inside a company. Let's take it to the macro for a second. Reed Hoffman, who sat in the same chair that you're sitting in right now, he's saying, wow. like, look, at you don't, you don't manage to zero chaos, yeah. it, especially yeah. in a startup environment. If you manage yeah. to zero chaos, then there's not enough innovation. There's not yeah. enough, it, Mario Andretti, if you're not driving, if you're not almost crashing, you're not driving fast enough. Yeah. So there's some happy medium there. And, and That's right. you know, in a startup, what we find, it, just Creative Live, it's like, as soon as we figure out a system and it gets super stable, then there's this, you know, everyone has the right amount of hours, and then it almost gets sort of like, boring is the wrong Are word. Are we but settling just, in? Are right. We, yeah, right. You, get, you start yeah. to get complacent. And yeah. In this environment, if you're not always creating the next thing, like what are we doing about VR? Or what are we, you know, what's the, that's the next thing around the corner? If you're not thinking about that, then it's hard to both be excited and motivated, but it's hard to like, I don't know, it, uh, it, there's just, there's this energy. And to me, energy, you know, life force or whatever, people feel that it's so palpable. And without it, what, do you, what have you got? I don't see a lot of creativity coming out of flat, low, organ, low, low energy organizations. So. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have to be, we have to feel stretched, right? Yeah. And especially highly talented people. You're not going to keep talented people in your organization for long if they're not in that kind of environment you're describing where it feels like we're always just on the edge. We're almost out of control, but yeah. we're somehow holding it together, yeah. right? Like that's where talented people want to work. Yeah. And, and there's seasons too, right? There's seasons, I think this, absolutely. There's so, a rhythm. It's rhythm, back to the rhythm thing, right? Yeah. There are going to be peaks and troughs. It yeah. can't all be peak all the time, right. you know? That's why like, if you think of an athlete, uh, Football season is a season. The athlete, or in this case, pro football, they get together for whatever, 16 or 20 weeks. Teams are all in, and then they have quiet periods. Or even seasons of the, like, winter. It's dark. <laughs> it's dark at, you know, at 4 o'clock, and it's dark until 8 a.m., and so people sleep more, they rest more. That's like, right. that's the way. And in summer, when it's on, you know, you just see these sort of patterns. And are you suggesting that, it's the leader's responsibility. It is. I think yeah. it is. Yeah, I believe it is because you know one of the things that we uh, unwittingly fall prey to as leaders is that we engage in what I call snapshot productivity measurement, right? Where it's like you know Jill is you know delivering. There's nobody here named Jill, by the way. I keep talking about Jill. It's like, <laughs> Our head of marketing at Creative Live is Jill. <laughs> okay, so right, she, right. Well, she'll listen to this. She's like, oh my gosh, Jill, Jill talking about you. <laughs> um, but you know we're, we're producing. You know Jill like does something that's like way over what we expected, right? Yeah. It's just over delivers and like 130 percent what we expect. And we're like, wow, that's amazing. And the next time Jill like basically hits her mark, you know she does 100 percent, and we're like. What happened to Jill? Where's the game, Jill? Right. Why, why didn't she over deliver? This is expectation yeah. escalation. You know, yeah. we engage in this as, as leaders sometimes. And we have to recognize there's going to be an ebb and a flow, a peak and a trough yeah. to creative productivity. If we expect peak productivity all the time, what's going to happen? Well, Jill's going to figure out the game pretty quick. And she's going to say, listen, I had to work like 85 hours that week in order to produce that. Yeah. And if that's gonna be my baseline expectation, I'm not setting the bar that high again. You yeah. know, I'm gonna I'm gonna sandbag a little bit yeah. so that you know it doesn't become this thing where like, why aren't you over delivering every time? Yeah. And teams do this, teams are really smart. You yeah. know, if we don't embrace the peak and trough nature of creativity, then teams will start occasionally kind of phoning it in. If they don't, if they take a hill, because this is the most important hill we're ever gonna take, and then there's another hill on the other side of you, like, uh, never mind, this is the most important hill, right? If, if they see that enough times, then yeah. pretty soon they're gonna say, hold on, yeah. I'm gonna conserve my energy because I have no idea what's coming around the corner. Yeah, which so is, we have to be really careful. Yeah, which is a pattern for lack of great work. So yeah. if, I think we were talking about that in the context of organizations or design leaders or groups and uh, you know, creative leadership. The same is true for individuals, mm. right? And I think I found this trap a lot when it's just you. And there's so many folks out there, solopreneurs, who are just getting started trying to go from zero to one, and they don't have a lot of um, outside input, or they're just like, oh, I, you know, I took this photograph, I designed this thing, I made this shirt, I built this you know, a small car wash company, or whatever the thing you built was. And it, if you don't have other folks, then you're always, either in like I'm killing it or I'm blowing it right. <laughs> mode. Right. And what have you seen or heard from folks to sort of moderate the individual independent creator 
What's the self-talk? What do you think healthy self-talk sounds like? Uh, well, so I think we have to extend ourselves the same grace we would extend to other people. I think we are our own worst critic. We're our yeah. own worst boss. Yeah. Um, we say things to ourselves that we would never say to somebody else. You're terrible. You're never going to amount to anything. Um, this is of course you blew it. Yeah. Of course you blew it. Of course you did. Of course. You know, what, what should I expect, right? Like, we would never say these things to other people, but we say them to ourselves. Um, we have to, and, and I'm not saying you should, you know, blow smoke at yourself and say, I am the greatest photographer in the history of, no, of yeah. course not. But you have to extend yourself a bit of grace. You have, to, you have to love yourself if you want to be able to love other people through your work, yep. right? And it's just the nature of it. Um, and so I think it's important to identify those narratives, those things that are playing out in your head. I mean, journaling is a great way to do this, yep. right? Writing out, like uh, I do an exercise called Morning Pages that mm -hmm. comes out of the book uh, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. It's funny how many yeah. artists engage in this, yeah, it's but an it's just book too. three pages of uh, stream of consciousness writing first thing in the morning. Uh, when your brain's still kind of waking up and you just write. And I am amazed, Chase, at the kinds of things that find their way onto the page. I have no idea in my brain, things I'm saying to myself, yeah. um, narratives that are playing out in my can life. You, can you go there for us? Like what are some recent ones that you know that you may, maybe would otherwise not share? <laughs> I know, it's, yeah, it's like, I know the nature of it, is, yeah, my, but, but just yeah. like uh, when you're morning, writing in the morning, I think some people think they need to put some great shit on the page, it needs to be insanely amazing, and it's like, yeah. no, no, it's actually just the opposite of That's the program. Right. The program is a brain dump, um, right. and then there's also a part of it which is programming yourself for what you, what you want your day to be, but yeah. talk to me about like, what, are, what does it sound like, or what are things that would be not uncommon to find in one's morning pages. Yeah, I, I, um, a lot of anxieties that I have yeah. about, um, and it's the typical thing you would expect of um, fear of failure, like yeah. feeling I'm not, I'm not enough. Yeah, I'm not sufficient. Um, feeling like I'm not equal to the task. Right, um, I'm blowing it. Uh, I, I feel like I'm blowing it. Even even in the midst sure. of things like going, if things are going really well, yeah. right? Like you could have. Um, you know, I, I spent my early 20s, I think I mentioned this off camera, I spent my <laughs> early 20s as a, as a musician, right? And um, we would play shows in front of a couple thousand people opening for some major act, right? And it was like, you're on top of the world. And the next night, it's like you're playing in a bowling alley for like 10 people. <laughs> and they're telling you to turn it down, you know? Right. Um, and that encounter in the bowling alley yeah. would leave more of an imprint than the night before playing in front of a couple thousand people who were like screaming and yeah. you know all of that um, because we are biologically wired to gravitate toward negative thoughts yeah. right so that we avoid pain and death and all this and there's a very real yeah. biological reason why we gravitate toward those things but, but we used to they used to keep us from the from the saber-toothed tiger th that's right but now it keeps us from embracing the big successful night out versus finding That's that right. the bowling alley, I'm the worst ever. That's right, right, exactly. Yeah, and so we have to be really careful about the stories that we tell ourselves yeah. as creatives. Um, and I mentioned expectation escalation as it applies to organizational life, but that applies to us on an individual level as well. Yeah. Are you comparing your in-process work with the absolute best thing that's ever been done in your industry? Right, and that's if you bought it on social media, like that's what I tell absolutely. you. Absolutely. You can't, because you know what's going on in your life. That's right. And you know when you look, or you should know, we don't, that when we look at someone else's Instagram feed, it's their highlight reel. That's right. Absolutely. And so right. we're programming, yeah. culturally, we're programming ourselves for this anxiety that I, it leaves me sort of, I think that's why some of the folks who are the most um, transparent and vulnerable end up having like more honest connections and because uh, that's what I want to see and feel. I don't want to just see some sort of glossy, shiny perfection. So that's right. it's culturally being rewired that we're not enough. And so, you know, whether through morning pages, we need to continue continually actively deprogram. Is right. that, do you use morning pages for that? I do, yeah. I do. And, and to identify what's going on in my brain and frankly, yeah. just to get some of that chatter out of my yeah. head. You know, I think, I think peripheral vision is a blessing and a curse, right? It's yeah. a blessing because it's great if you want to see what's going on around you and use it for inspiration and all of that, but it's a curse because it can very quickly become self-condemnation. You yeah. can see what other people are doing and think, well, I'm not doing what Chase is doing. Or yeah. I'm not doing what you know, this other writer's doing or these yeah. other people. And we engage in this kind of expectation escalation for our own work, and then we start thinking, well, what's the point? Totally. Why, why even do it? Like, if I'm not going to be the best, if I'm not going to be what that person is, then why, why even? We, we, we forget 
that that person was once sitting in the very seat that you're sitting in now. Yeah. That their finished product that you love so much probably was really crappy when right. it was in its first draft form, right? Yeah. And we also don't account for the role of luck. Like, you know, we, we look at these people who have you made, know, it, made it, right? And I mean, of course there's hustle. Of course there's having a brilliant idea. Of course there's being like really sharp and incisive and intuitive. Of course, all of those things. But there are also a lot of things that happen to get people to the top of their industry that we often yeah. don't like to talk about. Yeah. Uh, and we think, well, it's, it's always my fault. If I fail, it's always my fault every single time. The reality is you have to focus on the body of work that you're building and say, listen, I am gonna build a body of work that's reflective of who I am, of what I care about, of what I'm passionate about. And if it doesn't become the thing, I'm okay with that. Right. I'm okay just influencing the lives of the people that I'm able to reach with my work, and that's fine. I'm not yeah. gonna engage in this kind of expectation escalation that says that you know, if I'm not doing what that person's doing, then somehow I have massively failed myself. So we have to identify those narratives and make sure that they don't begin to you know, bound our behavior in an unhealthy way. Yeah, isn't it? I think uh, with such a radical idea, and I don't remember when I finally figured this out, it's, if you're always chasing sort of what's trendy or someone else's thing or the style or whatever, you're always behind. You're always sort of second, third, or 258th versus doing what is inside you, just plowing ahead. And it's the excitement of when the market actually turns and comes to the thing that you've been making for X days, weeks, months, years, or whatever, right. that you feel validated because you kept your own vision. And then the market, I mean, look at, you know, trends go up and down and what, you know, just even look at fashion, you know, the, right. I got stuff in my closet. I look, it's like, oh my God, I haven't worn that in 10 years. Yeah. And like, oh, it's cool again. <laughs> right. But you know what I mean? And right. I think there's this, there's a vision that you're always, that, that the creators are always chasing some new thing. And if you're just, the concept of chasing something is you're behind, right? That's right, that's right. Versus well, if, continuing to, on, you know, to build the thing that you're, you're building that you know intuitively internally. Yeah, and if, and if you haven't defined what success looks like for yourself yeah. um, in advance, there are always gonna be people who will be more than happy to tell you what success should look like for you. Yeah. Right, tell you what kind of thing you should be pursuing. Yeah. If you haven't defined that for yourself, then you might very well end up someplace and say, how did, how did I get here? Yeah. I am very far from my values, very far from what I care about, from what I intended to build. You'll spend your entire life and your entire career chasing vapor. Yeah. Basically chasing what everybody else tells you you should be chasing. Do you have um, some tactics for how to stay on that vision for yourself? Is this part of Morning Pages or is this a different habit? Um, I, I, well, certainly, again, themes come out, right, yeah. in the midst of that, um, yeah. for sure. But, I mean, surrounding yourself with people who are willing to speak truth to you, I yeah. think, is a really important, um, a really important discipline. Um, and that's something that has been a, a core part of my life for a very long time. Yeah. Because, you know, it's really easy, again, if you're building something, if you're sort of isolated. I had a, a great conversation with um, a phenomenal leader. Uh, uh, he's uh, former uh, General Casey, actually, former... Um, uh, oh. Yeah, uh, Army General Chief of Staff, right? Uh, we were both speaking at a conference recently, and I just said, hey, what, what's a thing that you see leaders doing? Like, what's a mistake you see them making? And he said, um, the more successful you become as a leader, the harder it is to find people who speak truth to you, right? Pe people don't want to say what they really see. That's so because, true. Yeah, because they want to tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. Why? Because you're, you're the one with all the power in the room. And I think the same thing is true for creatives. Yeah. Right? If you don't surround yourself with people who are willing to tell you, hey, here's what I see in you, here are yeah. the good things. Hey, by the way, you're doing something right now that doesn't really seem like you. Yeah, doesn't um, are serve you, okay? you or, yeah. doesn't serve you. It doesn't seem like it's on vision for where you think you wanna go with your work. Can you tell me about that? Like, what's going on? Why are you making this decision? Yeah. Um, it's a great question, by the way, to ask. Is there anything you see me doing that doesn't seem like me? You know, it's a great question. You ask your spouse, right? They'll, yeah. absolutely, they'll give you a ton of, <laughs> right? They'll definitely give you all the lowdown on that. But you know, I think a, a big chunk of it is just having people around you who are willing to speak truth to you and help you stay on course. What a great takeaway that is. How do you find those people? I think you have, the problem is I think you have to find them before you realize that you need them. Yeah. I think if you go looking for them. When you need late, them. Yeah. Help me. Right, right exactly. Like, 
and clingy. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So I think these I are think, the people that have been true to you for a long time, probably. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and people who know you, they've seen yeah. your entire journey. Yeah. They've seen the ups and the downs. They're involved in your your personal life as well as your professional life. Like they they you know that. I mean, you're, it's always easy to find people who will say, "Oh, you should absolutely do that. Yeah. Absolutely take that risk," because they just kind of want to see what happens if yeah. you do it, right? Like they really don't care about you. They yeah. just want to see if you crash and burn. Um, those are not the people that you want in yeah. your life. You can always find people who will encourage you. What you want are people who are willing to tell you, I know you really want this. I know yeah. you really want to do this. You think it's a great idea. This is not a great idea. Yeah. This might be a great idea for somebody else. This is right. not a great idea for you. And let's talk that through because I care about you. I really want what's best for you. Um, you know, We really, especially idea people, highly talented, creative people, we need those kind of people in our life. Yeah. So do you cultivate that? Is that... Um that's just, uh, there's, I'm trying to keep sort of two paradigms going at once here. One is the individual creator. So I think I, I, I identify with how that would logically fall. Like, so you got to keep people in your life, whether it's your spouse, your ex, your Y, or um, some people who you went to art school with, or the people you started your first company with, or whatever, inside of an organization. How does that, is, is that the role of the leader? Is that the role of every individual person in that group? How do you think about it? Yeah, well, the leader certainly can foster that kind of yeah. cross-pollination, those kinds of conversations. Yeah. Um, I think it's every individual's responsibility. I think we own our creative process. Not your mom, not your boss, not your, you know, whoever. Yeah. Like, we own our own creative process. And so we have to be responsible for finding those people in our life yeah. who are willing to speak truth to us. So if you don't have someone in your life that you can go to. If you have an idea mm -hmm. for something you want to do and you can't immediately think of, this is the person I need to go share this with, that's probably something that you need to start working yeah. on in your life. Yeah, because we all we Cultivating all Cultivating this... community, the community that cares about you and, right. and understands you, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow, so the cultivating community thing, I, I, there's two angles I want to go down right now. I want to put a pin in cultivating community, but I also want to talk about some specific habits that you have. You said we're all, we all need to own our own creative process. Right. I think one of the things that I hear from a lot of folks who are in a sort of second career or third career or folks who are trying to go from zero to one, they've said, okay, cool, I'm leaving this old life and I'm gonna do this, is sort of personal voice, personal style, personal set of behaviors and habits. And one of the ways that I love to uncover that is just by asking people who are on the show, like, what is yours? Yeah. Now, this is meant to be inspiration or rip it off and copy it and see sure. if it works for you and tweak tweak what doesn't. But so let's talk about Todd Henry. What's Todd Henry's uh, personal creative process or what are some habits that you have? And maybe you can talk about around your writing, around sure. the book, or um, take me through morning or habits and, and just yeah. identify that for me. So I, um, I've had the same morning routine for about 15 years now. Wow. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a long-standing tradition. So I get out of bed, uh, of course, first yeah. thing I do, I get out of bed. There we go, we're done. Sorry, this podcast is in Todd Henry's bed. <laughs> we haven't made it out yet, no. Just I get out of bed, um, I make the same breakfast every morning and I've had the same breakfast, same thing for breakfast for a very long time, uh, which is oatmeal, frozen blueberries, and some nuts. Um, Wow. And uh, the same coffee mug for the last 15 years. I have two of them, these two gray mugs. Um, and I rotate them from day to day. And I've had the same mug. And I go do to you my travel? Home. We're in Los Angeles and you flew here I, I, I don't. Cincinnati. I don't travel okay. with the mug. Actually, when I do have my own like, morning routine when I'm traveling, though, okay. which is totally different. And I did do this morning, okay. actually. But, cool. um, but, uh, and then I go to my home office and I study. And I write for an hour. That's when I, I read whatever I happen to be reading at the time. Um, and I... Don't just read, but I think about how does this apply to my life and my work, and then I engage in morning pages um, and do some journaling work as well. So that's really the first kind of hour of my day, and that's my family's you know, sort of getting out of bed, and they're kind of getting ready for school. I have three kids, so like oh, wow. they're all nice. sort of getting ready for, for work or for school, and, and we're trying Put to get work around. early. Around. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. right. Go to work. <laughs> uh, so they're all kind of getting ready, and then I'll typically see them off to school, and then the very first thing I do if I'm working on a book project, which I've just written you know, four books in a row, so basically yeah. I've only had like a couple of months in the last eight years where I've not been under deadline for wow. a book. Um, the very first, first thing I do is I work on whatever my, my core writing project is um, that I'm working on at that point. And um, I have a word count that I try to hit and it's not a minimum word count, it's a maximum word count. Um, so if I'm ooh, working ooh, on, a, on a, a project, um, you know, most book manuscripts are like 60 to 70,000 words or so, like at least in the space that I'm, that I'm writing in. 
Um, and I'll write like maybe 120,000 words to get to those like 60 or 70,000 yeah. because a lot of stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. But um, I know that I have to sustain my momentum, my enthusiasm, my energy for the project. And if I sit down and I'm really inspired and I write like 4,000 words in a day, then I know the next day I'm gonna be like, you know what, I'm good, I'm yeah. covered, you know? Um, and then the next day I'll be like, well, you know, I actually wrote like even, I wrote enough to cover today's load too, so maybe I'll just kind of put it off, or, you know? Um, or I might write myself into burnout, right? I might get to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm out of ideas. So what I'll do is I have um, a maximum word count. Typically for this book, it was 500 words wow. a day. And I know if I write 500 words a day, five days a week for X number of weeks, I'm gonna to get to my target word count for the manuscript. Yeah. I write 500 words. When I get to 500 words, if I write 501 or 502, I'll stop, like in mid-sentence. Um, because I wanna know where I'm gonna pick up the next day. I call it ending with the beginning in mind, right? Yeah. You hear like, begin with the end in mind. This is like yeah. ending with the beginning in mind. Um, wow. I try to end my writing session knowing exactly where I'm going to pick up the next day. So when I sit down the next morning to write... It's in a mid-sentence. It is. It's in mid-sentence. And I just start writing because I know exactly where I'm going to start the next day. And it's helpful, too, because I tend to write books from the inside out. I don't write in linear format. Okay. So I might start in the middle of the book and be writing a chapter. Or I might skip from chapter to chapter as I'm writing, depending on that day, like what, whatever is kind of inspiring me. Yep. So it, it kind of helps me to keep my pace and to make sure that I'm uh, staying in line with my, my objectives for the book and kind of where I want them to go. So that's wow. been a really helpful discipline. Um, in Great by Choice, um, Jim Collins talked about the concept of the 20 mile march, uh -huh. right? So like you get up every day and you march 20 miles and if it's a beautiful day, you march 20 miles. If it's like cold and miserable and sleeting, you march 20 miles. But like that discipline of just the 20 mile march, some days it's gonna be easy, some days it's gonna be hard, yeah. is something that's really helped me as a writer. Just knowing like, listen, I'm gonna give myself permission to stop. When I get yep. to a certain point, I'm done. I've done my work for the day, I can feel good, I, you know, I've made progress and I know I'm gonna hit my target if I just keep putting enough of these 500 word days together. I think this is gonna be a breakthrough for a lot of people who are listening. Yeah. And I think, talk to me, relate this to flow because we yeah. were also told in other paradigms, we've had Stephen Collar on the show, it's just like, sure. oh man, your whole goal is to get into flow and you're in flow, yeah. just effortlessly pour out and you're like, you just get into flow and word, word count 426 and then you only get like, 18 words or whatever, 75 words when you're in flow and then you gotta, right. you gotta stop because you're following Todd Henry's idea of only writing 500 words a day. Yeah. And you pick up, I like the concept of, because people tend to look at a blank page and the, we're using the blank page here in writing as a metaphor for all you folks out there. It's not just for writers. So you sit down and he's like, oh gosh, you can just pick up where you left off. Does that, where is the maxim, where do you maximize? Do you maximize on having to like sit down in the morning and you see the partial sentence and you know exactly where you're going, you think that pays off? Or how does, like, what, what about the concept of flow? Help me, Todd, I'm confused. <laughs> you know? Well, and so I think this is a really difficult uh, balance for us, right, as creative professionals, yeah. because you're right. I mean, ideally, like, I'll write 50 words and I'll start experiencing breakthroughs and flow and all of that, and the next, you know, several hundred words will be, like, in that moment of creative rapture. Yeah. The reality is that I think those moments of flow are fewer and farther between than yeah. we often want them to be yeah. as creatives. And if we depend on experiencing flow in order to produce our work, I think that you know, a lot of days I'm probably not gonna produce a lot of, a lot of work, yeah. right? Um, so for me, I, I, you know, I, I kind of see it as my job. You know, I know Steve Pressfield has said, you know, basically sit down, do the work. You have to carry your lunchbox, yep. you're to the job site, you sit down, you do your thing, and when you're done with your thing, I mean, some, some writers have a different approach. They say, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna write for an hour, I'm gonna yeah. write for two hours. Yeah. I'm gonna write, you know, they have like a time yep. limit instead. Um, this has worked really well for me to do this. Now, I, I don't tend to get into flow when I'm writing, which is funny. It's like even, you know, it's, it's not, not something that I've really experienced a ton. Um, I do tend to get into flow when I'm conceptualizing. When I'm thinking, when I'm creating, when I'm whiteboarding things, yeah. that's when I tend to get into this state of you know creative sort of creative ecstasy, the you know Mihai Chiksa Mihai flow kind of thing. Yeah. Where I feel like I'm challenged, but I have the skill kind of to meet the challenge, right? Yeah. Um, that tends to happen to me when I'm conceptualizing much more so than when I'm doing the tactical work of writing. So maybe that's why I don't feel the need right. to to get into that when I'm writing as much. But, Interesting. Yeah. I think that might be the, you might be the first person I've sat with has that has separated tactical 
actually creating the craft from conceptualizing as still a very important part of the process, but that flow is in that concept phase. And I'm just sitting here thinking that, crap, I think that might be me too. Yeah. Like when I'm shooting a photograph or uh, you know doing whatever the thing is, writing, for example, I'm working on some stuff right now. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, but you can, this I mean, is if you're, if you're yeah. on demand, if you're on set and you're yeah. making a photograph, sure. right? Um, you don't have the luxury of telling everyone, okay, everyone, I we're mean, just going to do a bunch of stuff until I start to feel it, right? <laughs> until I start to, I mean, you, you don't, like you're burning right. money. Yeah. I mean, it's like you might as well just take a wad of cash out and light it on fire and, you know, because yeah. you can't predict when that's going to happen. Right. You just have to produce work. Yeah. And sometimes in the midst of producing that work, yeah. you're going to experience creative ecstasy. Yeah. And sometimes it's going to feel like drudgery. And yeah. the funny thing is, I don't know if you've experienced the same thing, but the funny thing is, the moments when it feels like drudgery to me are sometimes my best work. Yeah. And the moments when it, I feel that creative ecstasy, like, oh, this is really great. And I go back and read it later, I'm like, what was I thinking, you know? Right, right. And so we're, we're terrible judges yeah. of our own work. Yeah. We are so terrible weird. judges of our own work. And sometimes the moment that feels really good to us isn't really all that great from, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, right? Like, it was great for us, personally. Like, yeah. Hey, it was good for me. Um, but it's not necessarily good in terms of meeting the objective. I think it's cool to be able to be okay with having flow state in a conceptual brainstorming strategy part of the world. My best ideas have come in that sort of space for sure. Yeah. When I think it's an important uh, sort of thing to shine a light on, which is we can't be our most creative amidst chaos. Like yeah, that's, yeah. you know, it's sort of like you're taking in information, input, 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 the synthesizing sort of takes quiet, it takes space. You talked about right. white space earlier. Right. Um, I think that's true for me. That's also a pattern that I've seen on the show. Um, all right. Well, that's another, that's another ritual. I, I take a, a long walk in the middle of the day, and I often experience flow in the midst of those long walks, because I take a long walk and I'll put some kind of drone-ish music on in the background and just be thinking about a problem or conceptualizing or coming up with like whatever I'm gonna, you know, whatever I'm working on, whatever the project is. Yeah. And often it's in the midst of that that I experience that sort of creative ecstasy where I feel like, oh, you know, things are really clicking and my mind's going a million different directions and my heart starts racing and all yeah. of that. Um, it's often in the midst of those kind of conceptual walks, much more so than when I'm like doing the tactical craft yeah. that I have to do in order to, you know, oh, make I just feel like I got so. a little bit more free. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tools. Let's talk, talk about tools for a second. I think yeah. some of your habits, your morning routine is great. I think that's... Um, I cracked something open for me, but talk about some of the tools. We talked earlier about Scrivener. Yeah, I love the, Scrivener. The writing tool. Yeah, um, Scrivener has completely changed my world um, as a writer because um, I don't write sequentially. I mean, if you don't write sequentially, I write from the inside out, and Scrivener allows me to write sections of a book as I'm sort of... It's almost like you're writing on Post-it notes and you can move it yeah, around. Yeah, exactly, and you can move it around wherever you want it, um, which is far superior to having to cut and paste and you sort of write in more linear format. Now there comes a time when you have to start writing a linear format, yeah. when you have to start filling out yeah. uh, the book, but um, it's really helpful to somebody who is you know, sort of a bit of a drifter. I tend to yeah. bounce from idea to idea. It's helpful for me to have that kind of flexibility. So I absolutely love Scrivener. Wow, and is that available on all the devices? It's know? on all the devices. <laughs> and Because okay. uh, a lot of my ideas are coffee shops or airplanes <laughs> or whatnot. Yeah, so you can, you can use it on, I, I use it on my, my Mac. Um, I also use it on iPhone, iPad. So like if I want to go to the pool with my kids in the afternoon, okay. in the summer, I can sit there on my iPhone and yeah. actually work on a book, which I shouldn't be doing. I should be hanging out with my kids, but I right. do it anyway. Um, <laughs> you don't want to always be in the pool, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, okay, other tools, other little, you know, I, I don't know if it's hack or like what are some tools of your trade besides the software or anything? Yeah, so I am um, for... You said the journal also. We I do. about that, Julia Cameron's sort of morning pages. Morning pages, right. Yeah, and I use, um, I created a, a sheet for myself um, that I use every day. I call them my day sheets. And basically it's a way for me to track my daily activity, you mm -hmm. know, to so sort of log my daily activity and what I do and what I accomplish and all of that. Um, but I also have on that sheet... Um, a uh, 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 space for tracking what I studied that day. So what I interacted with, what I read, um, what I learned from it. 
Um, so I keep all of those notes in one place. And then also- When do you do that? Do you do that at night before you go to bed or do you do it in the morning about the previous day or? No, I do it as I'm, as I'm actually doing it. I'll record like, hey, here's what I read. Here's what I learned from it, all of that. Like I'll take notes as I'm interacting wow. with whatever. Okay. And then um, there's a space to record what I call the dailies. And the dailies are the daily practices that I want to try to engage in every single day as a matter of ritual. Yeah. Um, so there are a handful of dailies that are just right there on the sheet that I practice every single day. So like one of the dailies is I want to have a meaningful conversation with my kids every day, like each of my kids, which is difficult when I'm traveling, but yeah. I try to. Yeah. Um, but you know, if I did it that day, great, check it off. Um, your meditation is a daily practice, check it off, great. Study, daily practice, check it off. And then there's some business things like business development. I want to engage in business development, some yeah. active business development every day, great, check it off. Yeah. Uh, review projects, great, check it off. You know, so there are a certain number of dailies that I engage in as well. How many days. roughly? 200 or there four? Are, or? There are eight dailies, eight. yeah. Yeah, so I think this I is awesome. Yeah, no, I've, I've got 10, <laughs> and I've okay. developed those to 10 over yeah. the course, and they occasionally come and go when they're truly, absolutely habits. I don't have to think about them anymore. I track them. Yeah. I stop tracking them, but I got 10, and I think um, that's fascinating. There's so much line. Then do you share your your this page that you've made, or is it very private? Like, is there a place where people can go to find it? Or you, that's a great idea. Actually, I think you should publish I, it. I think I should. I think yeah. I should share it. There you yeah. go. Maybe it's a, a page in one of your future books. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I think I, I'm going to put a bow on this. To me, that you, you have sort of written from a couple of different perspectives, right? You've written from the individual creator to the creator trying to fit into their space, from the leader leading inside of organizations. Um, or you know, big or small, uh, have you completed your, you know, the tour de creative, <laughs> or like what's what's next, or what do you, yeah. you know, what's in the hopper for you? Um, I don't, I don't know. That's yeah. a, I'm, I'm in that space right now where I'm trying to figure out what the next thing I'm going to make is. I mean, I have some projects I've been working on, um, yeah. back burner projects I've been go. working the on. There you go. the back burner. Um, so yeah. they may be the next thing. Um, I know we've created a bunch of. Um, personal like interactive workshops around herding tigers because we really want, you know, my goal is never just to write a book and give people interesting ideas. My goal yeah. is to transform behavior because it's only when we act on what we know that we actually change our lives and the lives of the people around us. Yeah. And so we want to really try to help people build practices and disciplines and rituals and conversations and things into the workplace to create yep. a space where creatives can come alive. So yeah. that's something that we're working on and launching very soon. Cool. And uh, just super excited because, you know, I. I my goal is to try to help people be the leader that they never had, right? To yeah. try to be a leader that makes echoes, to be a leader that transforms lives. I mean, our legacy is not the work that we create. No matter how great the work is that yeah. we do, in 100 years, nobody's going to remember our, our work. Like, nobody's going to remember, you know, no offense, but like, nobody's going to remember your photos. Nobody's going to be right, remembering right. my books. Nobody's right. going to remember even the companies we build. Like, chances are in 100 years, like, nobody's going to remember those companies. But the impact we have through the lives that we influence um, through the people we lead. I mean, that impact is going to continue to ripple for generations. And so, you know, I just really want to help creatives and leaders be people who make echoes, who build a body of work they can point to and say, yes, that represents me. That represents the sum of my greatest accomplishments, not the sum of my greatest compromises. That's beautiful. Before we go, one final question. Yeah. And I get these questions all the time when we like flip the script here when I'm in this chair that you're in right now <laughs> getting interviewed. And people, I don't I hate like what's the most best, like any superlative sure. thing. So I don't ask those, but I do like being challenged in real time with no preparation. And so there are two groups. I, I'm gonna categorize roughly into two groups of listeners here. There's the group who is trying to figure out to go to zero from one, they want to transform their life and, and start a new one. Yeah. Um, so I want some advice for them, and then I want some advice for the people who are trying to go from two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, up to 10, they want to max them, or 11, we'll call it, they want to go to 11. So right. two groups of folks, give them a piece of Todd Henry advice, go. Zero to one. Uh, so the, the people going from zero to one, um, you know, it's, it's really important, I think, to recognize that there are gonna be people in your life who are gonna give you advice for all different kinds of reasons. Um, some people are going to give you advice because it serves them really well. Some mm -hmm. people are going to give you advice because they just want to see what happens yep. to you. You need to have a trusted council of advisors in your life, especially when you're in those places where you're establishing a new vector. You have to have people in your life who will speak truth to you, who will tell you when you have spinach in your teeth, people who will tell you when you're, you're full of delusion, yeah. um, and also people who will say, I think you can do this. I really believe that you can do this. I, this is a great idea. 
right? You need those people in your life. So you have to seek meaningful relationships. Uh, I know we already covered that, but like yeah. I can't no, no, emphasize that's that enough. Um, a nugget. You know, because when, when we're creating something for the first time, we tend to go into isolation mode. It's all about the hustle. It's about the grind. I'm working I mean, 75, 80, 90 hours a week trying to make something happen. And it's really easy just to close ourselves off to other yeah. people and to become the worst version of ourselves right when we need the best version of ourselves to be taking the forefront. So Beautiful. that would be my, my encouragement would be make sure that you're finding those people. Beautiful. Um, for people who are trying to, to go to the They've next They've been doing place, it for a while. They want to go to the next level. Um, I think it's important to recognize, listen, everything you do every day, every conversation you have, every dollar that you spend, every conversation you have with your barista at Starbucks, right, how you interact with that person, yeah. um, every product decision you make, every marketing decision, every hiring decision, all of that, you're building a body of work. You're building a delta that is the sum total of value that you created because you sucked air on this earth, right? And I think people lose sight of the fact that they're building that body of work, that body of work that's gonna stand as a testament throughout all time of what they cared about, of who they were, um, of what they valued. They lose sight of that in the midst of the fray, in the midst of all the little decisions they make. And that big delta, that big change is comprised of a lot of little deltas. Yeah. Little decisions you make every single day about where you spend your focus, your assets, your time, your energy. So my encouragement to people is listen, Make sure every single day that the decisions that you're making are decisions being made in accordance with what you value, with your definition of success, and they're not being made according to somebody else's definition of success for you. Because it's really easy to build a body of work and get to the end of your career and to look at it and say, I built somebody else's body of work. I built a body of work that was based on what everybody else wanted for me, not based upon what I truly valued. And if you don't have a framework for making decisions before you, you get in, what you don't do. about what you do and don't do before you get into those pressure packed moments, those critical moments, it's gonna be really easy to compromise your values. So build a body of work that's reflective of you and whatever you do, take the risk and don't take your best work to the grave with you, right? Like it's, it's just, it's not worth it. You're gonna regret a lot more of the things that you didn't do than the things that you did do and then realized, oh, that was really dumb, right? So make sure that you're building a body of work that is reflective of who you are and make sure you're getting your best work out into the world every day so you can point to a body of work with pride. Mr. Todd Henry, thank you so much. Thanks, I'm man. so happy to have had you on the show. Uh, don't forget to pick up Hurting Tigers, you guys, incredible book. Um, be the leader that creative people need. I'm Chase, this is another episode of the show. Mm -hmm.